tenth talk series of phase two on transitioning to modern energy for cook cooking. Uh, so just for those who've joined us for the first time, uh, this session has been organized by Finovista under the MEX program. So Modern Energy Cooking Services program is a UK FCDO funded global research program, which is working on accelerating the transition to clean cooking from biomass based uh, uh, cooking and traditional fuels. And it's doing the initiatives on a global level. Finovesta is the in-country partner for MEX program in India. And under the program, we are working on an array of initiatives uh, which span across uh, uh, you know, policy, research, evidence building, supply chain of solutions, working with entrepreneurs and the uh, clean cooking device manufacturers in India, uh, developing innovative platforms for stakeholder management and connect, and also uh, to discuss on various issues uh, regarding the transition to clean cooking. And uh, Talk Series is one of uh, uh, such kind of a platform that we've created. So basically, it's a virtual platform on which uh, you know, we organize these sessions on a monthly basis. Uh, in the phase one, we've already successfully organized 12 sessions and we are in the phase two on the 10th session itself. Uh, happy to share that it's a growing community. We have 1800 plus global registrations under this uh, talk series. And, uh, uh, you know, there have been discussions on multiple important aspects. So, uh, you know, today uh, all of us are over here and I'm very happy that we are going to be discussing a topic which is very, very close to my heart specifically. So we all know um, that, you know, uh, globally around the world, the daily cooking responsibilities are largely held by women and girls in the households. So not only the responsibilities of cooking, but fuel collection and managing the household budgets in case of cooking with traditional fuels. We know that apart from the fact that, you know, it has, uh, uh, you know, impact on environment and health, but of course, women and children are disproportionately impacted. Uh, we understand very clearly that there is a high cost in terms of the time and the efforts which are spent by women. Uh, they get less time for their leisure, for their children and family. Of course, uh, you know, this creates a lot of gender inequality. Uh, being a, a, a woman in the family and taking care of all these household chores is of course a non-paid job and it's you know there, there's a lot of time and uh, uh, you know personal energy and efforts which are actually spent over it we know that transition to clean cooking uh, globally would actually ensure improved health for women it would improve uh, uh, you know the overall environment ensure the safety of their children a lot of me and leisure time and of course open up a lot of economic opportunities for the women globally so this brings us to the topic for today which is how we can actually engage women in the whole aspect of transitioning to modern energy for cooking to ensure that we are actually achieving the universal access to clean cooking and the importance of, uh, you know, making this sector more, more inclusive and more user centric. From today's topic and today's discussion, we are hoping to get some, uh, uh, you know, aspects on what are the perceived gender specific barriers and how we can actually address those barriers. What are the kind of platforms which would be effective to connect policy makers with men and women groups and how we can see the role of women as entrepreneurs in catalyzing the market in developing more culturally appropriate and sustainable solutions. So with this, I will uh, now, uh, uh, you know, open the floor in terms of uh, starting this session. 
but before that just a small uh, you know announcement of one of the initiatives that we are currently running this is about cooking pitch green which is an investor uh, connect initiative that uh, um we are running under the modern energy cooking services Amazing. program Amazing. in india and more details about this will be available on our website and my team will be sharing the link the important thing is that the applications for this program is closing on 14th august so i would request uh, uh, you know the fellow entrepreneurs and the clean cooking startups to have a look at the opportunity and uh, just uh, about the next talk series which is going to happen on 17th august on supply chain yeah so with this i will actually uh, uh, invite our first uh, speaker for today uh, so i would request uh, uh, miss silvia sartori uh, she is with us today she is a senior consultant with eco a management consultancy specialized in design formulation and assessment of energy and climate change mitigation and adaptation projects and programs uh, silvia has been working for past 17 years on multiple international development and cooperation projects in asia at the nexus of energy environment climate and women's empowerment and entrepreneurship uh, private sector development innovation and um, sustainability Uh, she is also serving as a senior expert on women in energy in central asia with the organization for security and cooperation in europe i will request silvia to please uh, uh, you know share her experiences and her learnings from a lot of initiatives that she is already engaged with globally over to you silvia thank you very much hital and uh, good evening everyone or good afternoon to anyone else that might be joining from europe it is really a pleasure yeah, to be here with you can you hear me all right okay sorry because i was hearing an echo very good thank you for confirming yeah i was saying first of all it's really a pleasure to be here with you today and i would like first of all to thank the organizers sincerely for uh, for organizing this event in the first place and uh, to for extending their invitation for me to speak at this talk session which is on a topic that remains indeed critically urgent and requires our utmost attention Uh, as uh, it has already been anticipated i have been engaged with different donor initiatives related to the clean cooking sector in asia and in africa for about 10 years and i have seen in different capacities how different mm -hmm. actors have been testing different approaches so it is based on these experiences that i would like to share with you here today some reflections which have made on these topics and which i hope will be helpful to spark a debate and to contribute to new visions and approaches mine i warn you are possibly not going to be the most traditional and conventional reflections that you might expect on such a topic but it is because i believe that the urgency of the matter calls us to dramatically change the way how we think of this problem and the way how we try to address it So the first reflection I made when I received this invitation is about the timing. In 2023, seven years away from the Agenda 2030 target, here we are debating about the value and the ways to engage more women in the clean cooking sector, a sector whose products are predominantly used by women. So my first question and my first thought have been. what does this tell us of where we stand in terms of advancing gender equality as a whole and in terms of promoting clean cooking the fact alone that we are still here discussing why and how more women should be involved is for me a sign that things are not progressing and they are not progressing at the pace we need especially if we consider that as of 2020 there were still 2.4 billion people around the world without access to clean cooking these are data from the world bank and you can easily guess who most of those 2.4 billion people are women of course one of my initial considerations is that we shall be careful about how we frame these conversations because opposite to our intentions they may actually end up reinforcing the belief and then the practice that clean cooking is a women's matter when not only it is not a women specific matter 
but also it is precisely the notion that clean cooking is about women that is part of the problem. And I will come back to this in a moment. My second reflection, in fact, has been about the title of this event. And I was wondering, is engaging women across the clean cooking value chain truly game changing? From the multiple projects, pilots and initiatives that I have seen, especially in sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia, I personally think that what would be truly game changing would be to have more men around the cook stove. What I mean is that I think we need less segregation between men and women along the whole value chain. And we need to stop thinking in terms of which gender performs which activity, and then from here, which gender should be involved at which stage of the process. In other words, we shall start by questioning the association cook stove equals women. I think we need to promote a reframing of household responsibilities and duty performances, first of all, because it is only when men also understand in practice what it means to deal with cook stoves that the urgency and the importance of the changes that we are advocating here today can be scaled up. Let me give you two examples to better explain what I mean. In June 2020, the Clean Cooking Alliance, Sustainable Energy for All, Energia, and members of the People-Centered Accelerator held a webinar on women entrepreneurship in the clean cooking and sustainable energy sectors in COVID times. The purpose was to understand how the unprecedented crisis was impacting on women entrepreneurs in this sector and how they were coping with it. We are all very well familiar with the long list of challenges that COVID has created, but what struck me during that webinar was the experience told by one sub-Saharan African entrepreneur. She explained that during the lockdowns and despite the general economic crisis, the loss of livelihoods and all those related financial problems, sales of cleaner cook stoves had suddenly and steadily increased. So while financial availabilities were shrinking at the household level, clean cook stoves were suddenly becoming an essential product in the local markets and demand was rising. And why was it so? Because as a result of lockdowns, men were spending unusually long periods of time at home. And then they started realizing how inconvenient, how uncomfortable and how hazardous the traditional stoves were. So procuring cleaner and safer stoves became a priority for them and for their household, even in difficult circumstances such as those of the COVID days. The second example refers to a pilot project that was supported by the Gender and Energy Innovation Facility. The facility was a program launched by Energia together with a number of donors, including the MAX program, in fact, between 2020 and 2022 to pilot projects in Kenya, Tanzania, and Nepal that developed, tested, and evaluated innovative approaches to address the persistent gaps in the gender and energy space. Clean cooking was one of the three target areas of the program. A very innovative project in this sector was developed and tested in Tanzania. The first novelty about it was that it was designed and implemented by a very unusual actor in this landscape, which is to say a digital media company. The other novelty is that one of the ways how it set out to address gender inequality and access to clean cooking was by developing cooking classes with and for men. Specifically, the project produced a series of video episodes showing men in the kitchen using different stoves and cooking different recipes. Then they broadcast these episodes online and on social media, including reviews and comments on the different stoves that were being used. At first, frankly, it has been very challenging for them to find male candidates who were available to be on stage and to be shown in a kitchen. This was, this was clearly an open challenge to traditional norms about masculinity. But it was also a way to show that cooking is linked to family, to society, to culture, and that it does not necessarily have to be a gendered responsibility. This was definitely one of the most innovative approaches that we have seen in the clean cooking space in many years. Of course, we know that changing social norms and cultural perceptions is a slow process that does not deliver tangible results overnight. However, addressing social and cultural root causes of inequality 
and the gender allocation of tasks and responsibility is, in my opinion, equally important as, for instance, developing new products, designing new marketing strategies, promoting access to finance, or adopting new regulations for a conducive ecosystem. And on this topic, I would like to make a final note. When we speak of inclusiveness of women in the clean cooking space, we shall also not overlook the importance of having women in decision making. The voice, the perspective and the needs of women need to be conveyed also in the regulatory environment, at least as much as they need to be included in industry and customer engagement. Because one reason why this topic is still not being given enough political attention and priority is because women are significantly underrepresented, if not missing, in the fora and at the tables where decisions are taken and regulations are developed about energy, resources, development plans, and growth strategies. So I believe my time is up, so I will stop here for now, but I shall be happy to take any question or discuss further during the panel. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sylvia, for sharing those points. I think uh, a lot of your points were, uh, will be on the mind of a lot of women over here. And the okay. important fact that you have shared that it's very important for women to be present where these discussions are happening. And having been worked in this sector for quite some time, uh, you know, I also personally feel this aspect uh, very clearly that the discussions would be swayed very differently if we have more women in the room rather than uh, men discussing these issues. So with this, uh, I think uh, we'll move forward uh, with our panel discussion. And for that, I would invite our moderator for today, uh, Dr. Joni Cook. She's uh, the MEX communication officer. Uh, Joni's worked in the renewable energy and international development landscape since March 2017, having previously managed communications for low carbon energy for development network, LCEDN. Johnny holds a PhD in geography and specializes in plant ecology. So Johnny, I would request you to please uh, take this forward and also to introduce your panelists for today. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sheetal. Uh, so welcome all. Uh, we are delighted to welcome our panelists of experts from the clean cooking and renewable energy sectors and our audience to today's webinar on such an important and timely topic of advancing gender equality in the clean cooking sector. So before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to provide a short overview for context. The energy sector is one of the most gender imbalanced sectors. In fact, the IEA report that it is almost twice as male dominated as other sectors. Women earn on average 20% fewer wages than men and continue to be underrepresented in leadership positions. However, for the clean cooking sector, we lack gender aggregated data, and there is also a need for a unifying framework to measure and assess gender impacts of modern energy cooking solutions. Advancing gender equality in the clean cooking sector itself is a critical part of achieving STG 7 and 5. Women are critical agents of progress, for example, Recent research by the Clean Cooking Alliance has shown that women are critical agents with women entrepreneurs selling three times more cook stoves than their male counterparts following empowerment training for women and men. Recently, the United Nations identified four key areas where gender inequalities are substantial in the energy sector, two of these being entrepreneurship and the enabling environment for women's participation. We will discuss today how we can empower women in these areas and more to accelerate the transition to gender equality in the clean cooking sector. Our expert panelists today come from diverse career backgrounds and skill sets, ranging from consultancy in areas such as renewable energy and climate change mitigation, research and academia to the private sector and bring a wealth of experience in spearheading gender mainstreaming initiatives in a variety of contexts and sectors to today's discussion. So let's offer a warm welcome to our panelists. Um, so firstly, to introduce Ritu Singh, Dr. Ritu Singh, who is the Deputy General Manager 
at Energy Efficiency Services Limited, where she has worked since 2015 and has implemented energy efficiency programs such as UNAT GOT by Affordable LEDs for All, the Streetlight National Program, and the Building Energy Efficiency Program. Ritu is also de designated as the gender focal point in the organization and spearheads gender mainstreaming interventions. So welcome, Ritu. Um, now to introduce Rina Suri, who is the executive director with India Smart Grid Forum since 2013. Rina has contributed to various advisory services reports, capacity building initiatives and pilot projects of the forum relating to electrification of public transport and infrastructure for smart grids and electric vehicles. Rina has been leading various initiatives to increase gender diversity in the energy sector. The initiatives were helpful in enhancing networking and mentoring programs for women, creating awareness of of and technology amongst women and attracting women to technical education and showcasing role models. Um, now to introduce um, Ms. Arthi Canadia, who is the director of Real Flame. So Arthi studied business management and is the only woman manufacturer of cook stoves amongst 50 to 60 manufacturers in India. Her experience lies in establishing supply chain and deep distribution networks for stoves in India. At present, the company under her directorship has sold over 3 million cooking stoves across all Indian states to provide clean yet affordable cooking solutions to the rural populace. And then finally, we have Sylvia Sartori, who's already been introduced by Sheetal. Okay, so welcome all. And now we'll move on to our discussions. Um, so if we could start um, with a question for Sylvia. Um, we all agree that the adoption of clean cooking solutions can decrease the amount of time and effort used for collecting fuel, fuel and cooking, thus allowing women more time to spend on generating income, pursuing educational training, or enjoying leisure activities with family. What do you think are the key economic, social, and cultural barriers for women for adopting clean cooking technologies? And also, from your experience of engaging with women globally, what do you think could be successful models for engaging more women in this sector? Okay, thank you. Over to you, Sylvia. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you for these questions, which are indeed very important. And I think we could easily have just a, a couple of talk series specifically to unpack these questions. These are really, really crucial. But, uh, since we just have a few minutes to, to try and address them. Let me try and identify a few key areas um, which could actually act both as a barrier as well as an incentive for a wider uptake of clean cooking technologies for women, depending on whether and how they are taken into consideration. So first of all, of course, we have economic factors. So things like the price of the stoves, the income level of the target um, women are, I think, the most basic things that are usually taken into consideration. There are then also social demographics details. So uh, elements such as the level of education of the women, their age group, they also play an important role on whether and how women go for a clean cooking technology. Connected to that is also their attitude toward technology. So we know again that different persons with different social demographic details tend to have a different feeling towards technology, uh, tend to trust it more than others or tend to be a bit more resistant. Um, technical features of the product themselves are also important and depending on the situations could act as a barrier or as, a, or as an incentive. And one element that is important to take into account in this, in this case is also that of fuel availability because uh, the, the technical performance of the stove itself might be good, but then if the women or the local community struggles to uh, procure fuel or if uh, related fuel is very expensive, then the appeal of the stall itself is, as a result, also affected. There are then elements uh, in terms of uh, general awareness and information. So well, we should also be asking ourselves, 
what type of information do our target women have about the risk of the traditional cook stoves and the benefits of the improved stoves? How much do they know about the health impacts or the environmental impacts and the environmental performance of, of the stoves they have and or those that they might be using if they switch to a cleaner product? Six, I would say uh, location is also a very important element because it has to do with accessibility, uh, with access to, um, uh, to the stores where the stoves can be produced or can be delivered or also maintained and repaired. And then, um, as I was mentioning earlier, elements of social and cultural influence are also very important. And here, um, you know, the importance also of the community where the women are, uh, are living and are embedded uh, is also very important. Perception is also an element that plays a very important role in the um, choices related to the stoves. And when we talk about perception, we should consider perception related to the convenience and the use of the stove. So uh, a stove might be uh, performing exceptionally, you know, in the lab and in terms of uh, technical performance, but might be perceived by the women uh, to be not so convenient compared to their traditional stoves or to be not so user friendly. And we've actually seen a lot of projects in the course of the years that came up piloting a really good stoves from a technical point of view, but uh, which were not taken up at all by the women because they did not consider them to be user-friendly or convenient. Aesthetics is also something that should not be overlooked. It might seem like a minor detail because after all we are talking of a stove, but it is actually still uh, an element that plays um, an important role in, when women have to, and households, not just women, decide which stove to go for. And then um, perception are also very much related to the impacts of the stove on environment and on health. Of course, as I said earlier, uh, different uh, persons might have a different level of information and awareness about the environmental and health impact of a different stove. But this is still an element that from a marketing perspective also plays a role in uh, determining uh, women's decision to go for one stove versus uh, another. Traditionally, I've seen that in cooking, uh, clean cooking related projects, a lot of focus has been paid on availability and affordability of the technology. But we've actually seen a lot of initiatives that precisely because they focus on these two elements alone did not actually lead to a wide uptake of, uh, of the improved stoves that they actually conceived. So the, the, the projects did well in terms of testing and designing uh, the stoves, but then something was going wrong in the outreach to the market and the stoves were remaining in a lab and no one was going to, uh, to buy them. Or sometimes we had even pro uh, programs where the stoves were given out for free um, to, to be tested and used. And even in those cases, the women were reluctant or resistant to use them. So we, my, one of my first advices would be really not to underestimate the importance of taking into consideration local specificities. So the local context where uh, the target women live, the local cultural and social dynamics, because these products, as with every other product that, uh, that we use, need to be personalized and tailor-made to the specific target uh, users. In terms of um, success factors, for models that could promote a wider uptake of, uh, of the stoves. Uh, as I said, first of all, it's really important that the, the stoves themselves and the process through which they are designed and they are, um, they are put into the market is really tailor-made as much as possible. So we cannot think of just one general product for, uh, for the whole country or for uh, any woman. Uh, we need to, to try and be as specific as possible, taking into account the local cultural demographics and, and social features of the target population. It's also important, in my experience, to think of the clean cooking value chain as a whole, including also the, um, the stages of maintenance and repair. I have seen a number of projects that were very successful in testing uh, cleaner cook stoves, 
but sh which eventually failed because the women had the feeling, and very often they were right, that if something was then going wrong with their stove, there was no one else in their area that was available to help maintain it or to repair it. So it's also important that when we, uh, we think of a new product, we think of the whole life of the product itself. So women need to be also reassured that if something goes wrong or if they have some questions about the product, there is someone fairly accessible that they can turn to to, uh, to use it. And I think in general, uh, the, the, the process of developing and uh, distributing improved cook stoves need to be developed and also sold as a co-creation process. Meaning it, it has to be a process where women need to be actively engaged from the start. Because as I said, this is a product that is going to be mostly targeting women. So it needs to take into account their needs, their concerns, their reservations, and they need to feel that they are part of the process and that they own the process as much as the producers. So they don't have to be, I think, um, treated as some kind of victims that need to be helped out, although obviously the, the, the product is going to benefit them first and foremost, but they need to be treated as co-creators of a solution that benefits them, but benefits society as a whole. And then I think my last advice would be also to uh, remind of the importance of considering access to finance, because we've seen many Many cases also of women um, who are either existing entrepreneurs or wanted to become entrepreneurs in this sector, which failed to uh, develop their enterprise because as a woman, they were struggling to get access to finance. So I think this is another problem and challenge we see uh, across a number of development sectors, but it does apply to clean cooking as well. So I maybe I will stop it here. Yeah. Happy to That's fantastic. Today. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for your valuable insight into breaking barriers uh, for women in adopting clean cooking technologies. Um, so to move on, um, we have um, a question um, that uh, Ritu um, is going to discuss. So um, Ritu, you represent an organization known for building successful models for large scale deployment of energy efficient solutions. What is the potential of a woman-to-woman -woman marketing model for achieving the success in promotion of modern energy-based clean cooking devices? And additionally, should organizations prioritize women as sales agents and product or brand ambassadors in addition to being managers and support staff in the company marketing? Uh, do you think adoption of clean cooking is quicker if the women in the family are engaged in paid jobs or have greater physical mobility? Okay, thank you, Ritu. Over to you. Uh, Sorry, you you're need mute, to you're unmute yourself. Sorry. I just forgot that it is muted. So thank you uh, for organizing this kind of event and thank you for inviting us because this is for the first time I'm getting associated with MEX and Enovista. Uh, so very rightly mentioned about ESL that ESL works on energy efficiency and we work under Ministry of Power uh, for implementing pro programs which are on energy efficiency. And as I had mentioned in my short brief that uh, we have worked on uh, uh, solar light, uh, street light program, and then for Ujala, which were the national programs. And also we have worked on solar lantern. Now coming to your questions on uh, uh, regarding women as a marketing agent. So we rightly feel that yes, women works uh, as a marketing agent because they are the main consumer or main user of uh, cook stove. And they are associated with all the ancillary, ancillary activities which is associated with cooking, whether it is collection of firewood or whether it is uh, uh, purchase of the grocery or vegetables. Uh, so she does all the work related to cooking. When it comes to uh, understanding and making them as a sales agent, because they are deeply involved in cooking, so they understand all the nuances, uh, the benefits and in and out of the cooking uh, process. So once we make them as a sales agent, maybe if they work at as an entrepreneur level or with sales agent, they work 
uh, for installation or for repair and maintenance. So for everywhere you see that they have a role. And this I would uh, like to present it, uh, explain you with an example, because uh, as I mentioned about the program uh, about Seoul, and uh, so Seoul on basically on Seoul, what we had done, uh, uh, this was a program launched by MNRE, where there was a MOU signed between ESL, MNRE and IIT Mumbai. IIT Mumbai was a technical partner. And this program was basically on assembling of the solar lantern and distributing it to students who do not have a grid connected electricity at their houses. And this was run in uh, five states where you have less than 50% uh, grid connectivity electricity. Uh, and uh, the woman back in states, uh, so there was further an agreement signed with the rural development through their Jeevika, uh, where uh, it helped us in identifying the, the woman as a champion who would work on assembling of the solar lantern. And they only initiated in distributing to those lantern to uh, school students. And the technical know-how was provide, provided by IIT Mumbai. And uh, through this program, uh, in a in a year of time, we could distribute 60, more than 61 lakh of solar lantern. But beyond that, the beauty of this program was that even after this program got over, because the women were given the technical training, so they continued with, uh, with that business and they continued to uh, collect uh, the spare parts, assemble it, develop it as a, as a product and sell it to the household, but this time not limiting themselves to only to the school students. It was anybody who were there in the rural area and who knew, who needed this product. And over the time, they also developed, they understood that they have to give the warranty service, so they maintained the quality. And simultaneously, because we had initially run a program on LED bulbs, so they, they understood that how they have to assemble the parts, the components. So they were able to do that with the uh, LED bulbs as well. And that's how we saw the penetration happening in the rural areas. And why my focus is more in the rural areas? Because uh, uh, in urban area, we still have a better life. But when you go to a rural area, we see that uh, there's again a constant beat for cooking, where still we find people, the women especially, that uh, using the uh, uh, traditional chula. So one of the National Family Health Service uh, that, that was done in, for the year 2019 to 21, that was the fifth, uh, fifth round of survey, where it clearly mentioned that 41% of the women still they are using the traditional chula for their co cooking and they are the more the drudged part of their life because their most of the fruitful time goes in cooking and firewood collection. So back back to my uh, uh, program that we have initiated here through EESL, we found that this kind of initiative it really it helps in replication also because it has a publicity from mouth to mouth and because we had engaged self-help group women so I would also like to mention the rural development department they have more than 80 million self-help women in the rural area across states where they are working on different uh, uh, sectors, be it like farming sector or on the entrepreneurship model or on the garbage collection, but they are involved in some kind of livelihood, but the, the monthly income that they're able to generate out of these activity is very less. It is not more than eight to 12,000 per month. So if we continue to have these kind of programs, which also help in replication because it has its own advantage, it gives you a revenue, it enhances your household income. So that also helps in keeping the program or keeping the work sustainable, which is more environment friendly. And uh, second thing, when we talk about, uh, so, uh, So one is that they are consumer, they are the main user. Second uh, is because they can be, they can become a sailor uh, as an agent. And third is they have more of the convincing power. As I mentioned that they are the main user. So you also see them that they are able to uh, convince more because they are able to demonstrate. They are able to demonstrate. So people living in their counterpart, their, oh, their in, in their premises in the same uh, uh, village. So they are able to reach, reach out to those women and see that how these uh, products are working, understand its benefits, and they are able to replicate it. So when we talk about the sales agents, so in 
the government program with the rural development when i mentioned about gbika so in one of the uh, uh, state bihar where we had visited in bodh gaya and we saw that uh, uh, the these self help group women have developed their registered company with gbika which is named as uh, uh, j wires and through this j wires they are selling these energy efficient appliances where they also selling this improved cook stove so that is helping them in generating their own revenue second we also saw uh, many women who are working on a commission like if you see uh, the companies like that uh, uh, detergent uh, uh, companies they engage women because main, mainly the detergents are used for washing clothes and again this gets related very uh, familiar with the women so they are selling such product through women where they are making them as an agent as a, on a commission basis and this is helping in reaching out uh, to more households and uh, through our soul program as i mentioned about the training program so that gives you a permanent like a skill set and which helps you in continuing with your program and continue with the revenue and uh, so this was for your first question second question was on uh, how to engage women as a whether the women should only be engaged as an ambassador or they should uh, uh, be as a sales agent so for this my concern would be that if you have to see them on a role of ambassador so it should be for more for both male and uh, uh, female both why because if we just keep only a focus towards women so it becomes very stereotype because then you all only relate with women and then you are not able to get the perspective of male because for everything be it design and if you want to make it like a participative where you want that women along with male should also be participated parts participative uh, in all the house chores so then i think male also should also be made part of this program as an ambassador but when it comes to as a sales agent where they need a professional training and where we see that the employment of women as rightly mentioned by john also that it is very less in uh, in the energy sector it is just uh, half of what male presence are there in the energy sector so then it makes all the more uh, convincing that there should be policy support from the government where you can have uh, enrollment of more women uh, uh, as a sales agent and uh, uh this would also help in, in, in uh, improving the livelihood of the people and that will also help in reducing their time uh, which goes in like invisible uh, work that they do at the household level be it cooking be it firewood collection or uh, be it looking after the children and this should be it becomes very automatically that the male counterpart start sharing all these uh, household chores and the female get more of the productive time to work for their profession the second constraint that we see once you make this woman as a sales agent then you also have to see especially in the rural area you also have to see their mobility challenge because most of the women in the rural areas if they are not able to go out of out of their houses it is just because they do not have their mobility access freedom because uh, they are more dependent either on the public transport or they are dependent on their family members who could help them in uh, getting like travel from one place to other so again esl has found that gap and uh, developing a program uh, which is named as electric bicycle to address the issue of women working women in the rural area who can have this independence of travel at their own convenient time and that also reduces their travel time so this i would support with one of the data that we uh, found uh, in one of the study done by the national uh, uh, nrhs and where it says where it said that uh, uh, because female is more engaged in the household chores so, so in a day they only have 6 hours of productive time for their professional work where they can go out and out of that 6 hours 30% of the time goes on travel so that's how this idea came to us that we have to address this issue of travel also when we want to make women equally capable well equipped and to run at par with male for all the activities be at home or be outside in terms of now your third question was that uh, uh, about the advantages so all with all these we see that we will be able to reduce the drudgery we will be able to improve the employability 
we will also be able to make women more represented in the professional world and based on our uh, like the insight that we have from the uh, several visit that we have done in past few months we have found that especially the young generation if you see even in the rural area this literacy is becoming very prominent people all be it like your uh, girl child or a male child everybody wants to study they are going to school so their enrollment in the school is increasing uh if we compare with the uh, older generation maybe in the category of 40 to 50 years so there you have less of literacy so that really helps in adopting to new technology because they understand so th the reservation or the mindset uh the rigidity that was there uh, earlier with uh, uh, with the uh, without uh, literacy so that we are seeing that it is getting diluted with the younger generation and younger generation is able to convince their parents or the older people in their family uh, to adopt to these new technologies so i would Brilliant. say that the, uh, thank you uh, very you much ritu that's a, 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 some really valuable insight there into um how women led um business models um can empower women as critical agents of uh positive change. Um so leading on um it's often been concluded that women's talents and insights are even more underutilized in the renewable energy sector and the sector is primarily perceived as as male dominated. What are the perceived gender specific barriers uh Rena uh that restrict uh participation in these areas? and how can we address these barriers to increase women's involvement in clean energy solutions to ensure that the benefits of clean energy reach everyone okay over to you rena thank you very much thank you so much uh, joni and i would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, modern energy cooking services for having me here as part of this important initiative and their uh, 10th talk show i'm very glad to see a uh, you know a good participation and particularly a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, male uh, participation uh, also so we have a gender balance here so i'm really glad but uh, however like you know i've been working in the energy sector for over uh, 20 years now and uh, with the transition that we see in the sector uh, uh, we see that gender equality is uh, Uh, has been uh, uh, the least addressed and uh, it is uh, you know it is not just a social change that we are looking for but it is rather, rather uh, now with the changes it is a business imperative for all the organizations to ensure uh, gender parity in the sector i uh, would also like to uh, highlight uh, that you know i have uh, had the privilege of being a part of the global women's uh, network for energy transition and uh, have uh, uh, you know been mentoring um, uh, as part of the women in clean energy uh, clean cooking i have uh, been a mentor uh, as part of the clean cooking alliance and sustainable energy for also uh, i'm very glad that i am able to contribute uh, to uh, some change that we are looking forward to bring so as regards the role and the barriers that we see uh, in the in the transition that we are uh, facing uh, from fossil fuel towards the clean energy sources uh, uh, of energy this will uh, require not only uh, you know innovative solutions that we are uh, working on uh, uh, in uh, to uh, facilitate the change uh, but uh, Uh, and business models and all but uh, to also uh, you know to a greater extent participation of a diverse talent pool uh, that we have seen and many barriers uh, exist that dissuade uh, women from pursuing careers uh, and leadership roles in the sector particularly uh, you know from what we have seen over the years uh, uh, most of the panels we see are led by women uh, are men and um, uh, you know the uh, leadership roles uh, in the board uh, Uh, you don't see a lot of participation of women so uh, there is a dire uh, need uh, to um, uh, you know bring a change here uh, uh, and uh, create awareness among the public and the private authorities on uh, the added value and need to promote uh, women uh, women's leadership and participation in the development of this clean energy uh, sector that we are looking for 
uh, and the, the renewable energy sector has immense potential uh, you know that uh, particularly talking about india there is a huge target that we have set and uh, for achieving that uh, uh, we not only need solution but uh, also as i mentioned we need a diverse pool uh, we need a huge uh, you know a number of people to be able to implement uh, uh, you know the pro projects and uh, uh, initiatives that the government is planning and uh, uh, however, uh, you know, the um, uh, women's talents are underutilized and the insights leading to uh, uh, prevailing perceptions of it uh, being primarily a main uh, male dominated uh, field, uh, you know, particularly talking about the renewable energy. So to address this imbalance and foster uh, uh, the increased uh, women's involvement in the clean energy solution, it is essential to identify specific gender, you know, gender specific barriers uh, 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 and uh, work towards this with the right policies and strategies. And uh, we have seen that the organizations, uh, particularly, uh, you know, for having uh, a diverse pool, uh, practicing diversity have uh, outperformed the organizations we have, which have not uh, implemented inclusivity and diversity in their sector. So more transformative changes uh, can be brought in uh, with the right mentoring, nurturing, uh, training and uh, you know having women in the leadership role and, the, uh, uh, and uh, that we have seen in the sector uh, over the years. And, uh, in terms of uh, women participation in the sector in general uh, holding the various initiatives uh, uh, undertaken in terms of having the right policies programs uh, in your in various organizations <coughs> or the energy sector that uh, you think uh, you know uh, that have encouraged higher participation of women and supporting them in uh, sustainable uh, uh, positions and jobs talking about uh, you know uh, as simple as having the uh, a job description in an organization which supports uh, women uh, yeah, like you know uh, uh, the role of women uh, and uh, uh, you know the uh, barriers that they have in terms of uh, managing the role that should be addressed right from the job description so to promote uh, brilliant uh, yeah to promote thank, uh, thank you, know, you very IG much oh, go ahead Sorry, that, thank thank nice. you, Rina. We're we're just um we're I'm just mindful of the time. Um, thank you very much for those uh valuable insights uh into how we can um um break the gender specific barriers in the industry. Um, so moving on, Arthi, um, how do you see the role of women as clean energy entrepreneurs in catalyzing the market in developing effective, culturally appropriate and sustainable solutions? And as a woman entrepreneur yourself what are your own experiences have you implemented any strategies to engage more women in your own business thank uh, you i'll see thank you johnny cook for your question and the organizers for bringing us together as a step towards gender neutrality um i think women bring unique perspectives skills and experiences of clean energy sector uh, which can significantly impact its growth and success. Women entrepreneurs often approach uh, challenges with uh, fresh perspectives and innovative idea. Uh, we have read and like seen and seen in movies that uh, men come home with a lot of stress and problems and we, we randomly come up with a solution that happens to be a million dollar idea and we have all experienced that. It's true that they diverse, their diverse experiences and insights can lead to development of unique and effective clean solutions. Um, we break gender barriers and uh, contribute more inclusive and diverse solution. So, and there is a special thing about women entrepreneurs that we are more social and environmental centric and not financial goals. Like we do not have much of financial goals, but we also prioritize social and environmental sustainability. So when we try to explain with empathy, people connect to us from heart. Today with globalization, um, when things have to be so quick and with perfection, it collaboration is key to success. And we see that women are very uh, good with collaborations and networking and partnership. We tend to be more attentive to customer needs and come up with tailored solution. And that uh, makes us 
excellent at networking and men here would agree that we are also excellent at remembering everything. So this customer centric fresh approach increases the acceptance and adoption of any product that we are working towards. If you talk about my experience, I'm from a joint uh, Marwadi family where the dominance of male is unsaid and compulsory. Uh, like, you know, uh, so if, uh, but for me, it was against human rights of not being able to pursue what I'm most interested in. Uh, when we are young, it's very difficult to say, okay, are we good enough to make it? Uh, but at that point, it's more important that someone believes in us. For men, it is understood that they would go uh, do something important and uh, uh, put food on our table. But as women, it gets very difficult to take the roads that are not taken. There are many around us to bring our spirits down. But the moment we start believing in ourselves, we actually start meeting people around us who show us spark or flight. And for us, it is important to see that spark of light and keep moving. I met many good and supportive men at work. One of them told me at a very early stage that stop giving excuses to yourself and stop telling yourself, oh, I'm a woman, so this did not happen, that did not happen. You're here, accept it, believe it, and do such things that people remember that, yes, they met you. And that was enough to bring all the change in my mind and it made all the difference. And uh, I realized in my mind when I removed that barrier, nobody could stop me from doing anything I ever wanted to do. So it's our mind that is trained by people around us and the systems that distinguishes the daily chores between men and women. I always ask why men, uh, men choose if can't choose if they want to be a homemaker or a bread, uh, like, you know, owner. Like the society has also put a lot of pressure on men as a bread owner. What if he doesn't want to earn bread? Like, and what if he doesn't want to take the pressure of earning throughout his life for his entire family? That pressure and that burden can also be shared. But we are made to believe that that's the only way to operate. In our organization, 70% of our work for, workforce is women. And, and I'm very adamant that she has to be a mother because a mother brings dedication, time, discipline, loyalty, and empathy in the team. And it's, it's a common practice in India that once a woman gets married, she leaves her entire home, friends, parents, family, and she goes to a new home and she makes her husband's family, friends, and surrounding everything as her life. And in our organization, we believe that when she can do that naturally every day and excel at it without being appreciated, then what if we give a purpose to her that appreciates her and helps her to be seen? That works for us and makes us a unique organization that is not only working for finance, but also bring change in our existence. And we are living in 21st century, and I think it totally should depend on a person if he or she decides to choose career or home. Both are excellent and beautiful. First, we need to believe and accept our choice. So, and I-, I Brilliant. Yeah, I Thank you very much, Arthi. That, that's a uh, really um, fantastic insight um, from an entrepreneurship uh, angle. So just for the last couple of minutes, if we just move to our audience, um, here we have some questions in the chat. Um, so one earlier, which Sylvia has answered um, in the chat, but maybe we could just touch on this now. Um, so over to Sylvia and the rest of the panelists. Um, what are the challenges that women have faced in access to finance and how are they overcome? And that's Dr. Purushottam Shrestha um, has asked this question. Okay, thank you. Thank you again for the question. It's a very broad topic, so I will uh, try to hint at uh, some uh, some elements of the answers. And I think my fellow panelists, from their experience as entrepreneurs, can also complement their views. 
the the challenges also vary quite a bit depending on the cultures and the geographies where the women find themselves but the most common challenge we find in this respect has to do with women being requested when they apply for loans or for credits to uh, show some collaterals or some guarantees. But we know that in many countries, either as a cultural practice or even as a regulatory prescription, women are not recognized ownership of assets. So as such, they, uh, they are not in a position of showing any collateral. And as a result, they are denied access to loans and credits and they necessarily then need to depend on their husband or father or other male uh, family members or acquaintances to be able to access credit. Uh, and another challenge has to do with the fact that um, uh, in, the, uh, in the financial sector in general as a whole, and this includes developed as well as uh, developing countries, women are still generally perceived as a riskier client compared to men, even though multiple research and evidence has shown by now how actually women tend to perform better than men when they, uh, they have been given credit. So they tend to repay their debts much more regularly than men, they default less than men, so they're actually more diligent in terms of their performance. But nonetheless, there is still this pre prevailing uh, cultural perception that we that it's riskier to lend money to women than to men. So here, I think what would be needed is, and what is already partially done, is a lot of awareness raising, a lot of engagement. And this, again, partially has to do with the fact that a lot of the leadership positions in the finance sector as well are held by uh, by men. So the, the position, the voice, and the profile of women is still not represented enough. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much, Sylvia. Um, thank you to all of our panelists today. Um, and it's been a really valuable and insightful um, session. Um, so um, over over to you, Sheetal, for the final final uh, comments. Thank you, Johnny, and thank you all uh, to the panelists uh, for uh, being with us today and uh, sharing your insights. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, like Sylvia said that, you know, we need a couple of talk series on, uh, uh, you know, a topic uh, to do justice on a topic like this. And uh, uh, like, you know, we are also internally mulling that, you know, uh, every 12 sessions that we have, we should at least have three to four sessions which are, uh, uh, you know, focusing on, uh, uh, you know, similar topics. And um, uh, we will be actually, this uh, entire session is recorded and we'll be sharing uh, uh, this to be published uh, very shortly. Aren't able to hear to the discussion, so uh, we'll do that. And thank you all again uh, for joining us today. And um, uh, we look forward to connecting back with you and uh, uh, discussing more on this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Aarti. Thank you so much. <laughs>